I just need to step recording. away for one second. Sure, this will take me a few minutes anyway. Okay, so we are recording and just show this a few minutes. <laughs> <Our key. laughs> uh, very good. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, we are very pleased that you could join us. Um, and as a part of the city's process for these online digital meetings, we have to be thoughtful about how we are creating both a meaningful and transparent engagement process and providing online security. So we have the following rules for all city uh, public meetings. The meetings are uh, called to conduct order to conduct the business of the city of Boulder. Activities that disrupt, delay, or otherwise interfere with the meetings are prohibited. The time for speaking or asking questions may be limited. Uh, in this case, the public comment periods for Environmental Advisory Board are three minutes. No person shall speak except when recognized by the person presiding, and no person shall speak for longer than that time allotted. Each person shall register to speak at the meeting using that person's real name. Any person believed to be using a pseudonym will not be permitted to speak at the meeting. If someone comes into the meeting with a telephone number or a name associated with a specific device, the host may ask for a full name before allowing the individual to speak. No video will be permitted except for city officials, employees, and invited speakers or presenters. All other participants will be by voice only. The person presiding at the meeting shall enforce these rules by muting anyone who violates any rule. If the chat function is enabled, it will be used uh, for individuals to communicate only with the host, and it will be used only for technical or online platform related questions. If an attendee attempts to use chat for any other reason other than seeking assistance from the host, the city reserves the right to disable that individual's access to chat. And only the host and individuals designated by the host will be permitted to share the screen during the meeting. And with that, Marty, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, great. Well, I'm gonna welcome everybody. Um, thank you for that um, information that we all get to hear every, every month before our meetings. Um, let's first maybe start by doing a, um, well, let's call the meeting to order and um, officially, and let's see if we can do an approval of the minutes. Are there any comments on the minutes from the last month's meeting in April? Oops, I just have a, um, it looks like we lost Hernan from the meeting. Um, but if you want to go ahead and vote, I think that's fine. I, I don't think I quite caught that. It was a little bit garbled. How oh, you... we lost a board member. We lost Hernan. Um, I don't see him as a participant. Oh, you are correct. Oh, there he is. Okay. Great. Technical difficulties. We were in there all the time. <laughs> um, Ernan, I'm just going to start off here by asking for approval of the minutes from the April meeting. Um, and if uh, there are no objections, then I'll ask for a second. Um, I actually had a, a correction. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm opening good. them up. Um, it's exciting, Miriam. We don't usually have to go <sighs> Sorry. for it. <laughs> um they're long i know they were long yeah um we we did a lot last month um and and oh that was the wrong link sorry i should have been organized for this in the minutes um i now i remember it was uh you see, we were talking about, um, I'm finding it. Now I'm not finding it. I'm sorry, you guys. Was it in the air quality section? I thought it was, but I'm yeah. not seeing it. 
I apologize. No, no worries. Okay, then I'm, I move to approve. Oh, we got a minute. Do you remember roughly? <laughs> I mean, I'll help you. See if I... I may actually be confusing two different documents that I read. And it doesn't look like it's in this one. Sorry, guys. Okay. No worries. Any other um, comments? Need for revision? Hearing none, and I heard the approval from Miriam, if someone would second that. I'll second that. All right, Susan, thank you. So let's look at the agenda in terms of the uh, public participation. Um, do we have a public participant online? Looks like we do. Lynn Siegel is going to um, speak to us for a three minutes. Oops. Welcome, Lynn. Then, uh, then, did you want to uh, speak as a part of public participation tonight? Yeah, I just came off the Pentagon and I just rushed in and it took a while to get me logged in. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I would like to say something about pre uh, saving pre existing housing in Boulder, as was marked at Marpa House last night. Um, they're going to redo Marpa House into, um, you know, probably thousand dollar a room bedroom you know uh 16 times three of those 48 people times two thousand a month you know and and you killing marpa house you, marpa house is fine you know my house is fine it needs to have a contractor that doesn't want to do pop brand new construction it's desperately in need of that and I'm never going to find one like that. You know, so what are you, the EAB, going to do to find me a contractor when he's got plenty of money to put up a new, uh, you know, have you seen across from the Chamber of Commerce? There's an army of high-end condos there. Like, they're like on every corner. Why would anyone want to work on a pre-existing house? They need subsidies to work on my house because they have to, and we have to get something going on at CU where they're going to have programs for creative architecture for guys to do, you know, or women to do jobs that are complicated, you know, and, and what are you going to do about Alpine Balsam coming up? You know, like that hospital should not be taken down. I mean, the medical pavilion, they could have sprayed insulation on the outside and put new siding on the side if it was low on its energy efficiency. They didn't need to friggin' gut it for $40 million or however many million they spent of city money. It was a high end indoors. Have you ever been in the Boulder Medical Pavilion? It was high end stuff and they friggin' gutted it. And this happened in Boulder on EAB's watch. Why? And now they're gonna carry that hospital out, you know? It's a beautiful integrated system there, the pavilion into the hospital. The hospital's a little bit straighter line. That's the only difference. You can change that. There's still the whole parking lot to put a new stuff on. But, you know, there's got to be more creativity in Boulder for doing, redoing pre-existing housing and pre-existing friggin' hospitals. You know, that's a lot of carbon footprint to move up on trucks, all of that heavy stuff of Alpine Balsam Hospital, that's like unbelievable. So where's the EAB on these issues to the city council? Just saying. So that's my two. Thanks. Thank you, Lynn. Appreciate you calling in. Any other public participants? I don't see any. You don't, you don't see me? Yeah, oh, we, Paul. Now I do. My mistake. Hi, Paul. Hi. Um, yeah, how's your crawl space doing? <laughs> I think we live in proximity, so we know what we're talking about. Yes. Yeah. And good to see Susan back. Um, I'm not I, back. I'm still on the road. Oh. You look homey. Um, I'm at a friend's house. Nice. Um, 
So I've been following a lot going on in the state. There's a lot going on at the legislature. There's a lot going on at the Air Quality Control Commission and the Public Utilities Commission. But what I'd like EAB to be looking at is the uh, electric resource plan that Excel has filed at the PUC. And I'd like EAB to push on the Excel and the PUC to make sure Proceeding. And I have to admit, I don't know quite how you're going to do that. Can't hear, Paul. Uh, you're mic. Oh, boy. Sorry. Start back where you were talking about Excel and the PUC, Paul. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I should have had my headset on. Um, I'd like uh, EAP to be following what's going on with the electric resource plan at the PUC and pushing Excel and pushing the PUC to make sure that Boulder has a path to 100% renewable electricity by 2030. Boulder uh, is so still so having audio issues. <laughs> it's just a bit low volume, Paul. All right, is this any better? Yes, thank okay. you. I'm sorry, I apologize. I should have been better prepared. Um, so I'd, I'd like for EAB to take an interest in the electric resource plan that's going on at the PUC. Um, so I don't know that that's on your agenda, probably not for tonight, uh, but maybe at some point you guys can take a look at uh, something that's very important to all of Colorado's future, including Boulder. And that's Excel is decarbonizing, but we'd like them to go faster and further. We'd like Boulder to be able to accomplish our goal of 100% renewable electricity. So that's that's where I'm at. I, I'm honored to follow my friend Lynn Siegel in comments, and it's always an adventure. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Appreciate appreciate your call in. <clears throat> Let's see. And I think that's um, our only two public participants. I don't see any others on my screen. Um, so with that, I think we're ready to go to our agenda for the meeting. Thank you again for those that called in, Lynn and Paul. Um, we have as a first item on the agenda to uh, return to uh, what we were sort of finishing on last month, which was discussing the uh, sort of existing climate commitment document um, that that um, has been shared, and hopefully you've had a chance to look at it. I know it came a little bit abrupt, maybe last meeting. It's worth circling back to it. Uh, the city is working on you know, revisiting some aspects of this. It's in formative stages still for, and, and Brett gave us some insight on that last month. Um, what I would like to do, if, if this is okay, I mean, I've jotted a couple of points that struck me that I'd like to just chat about. I don't know how much time we would have allotted from looking at this. What do you think? Maybe 15 to 25 minutes max, Brett? We, we could go even up to a half an hour. With this. You think we have a half hour space? Okay, that'd be great. Um, and maybe I'll just share what I had put in my notes and, and if, if that's a good point for discussion then let's do it. And others may have their own points and we'll bring those forward. Um, so you might recall from the document 2017, there are four action areas that are called out in it. And the most extensive one in, in the um, climate action plan is on energy, um, which makes sense. Uh, the energy um, aspect makes sense because the stated goal in that document is for an 80% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 for the city, as I understand it. Um, and the vast majority <laughs> arises from the energy that we use to, to sort of do our work and live our lives. So this gets very much at our community. Um, now my read of, of the plan is to achieve that by three activities. Um, and these need to be kind of going on at the same time. So three simultaneous, not sequential. And this isn't necessarily in the order of importance, but it could be. 
The first one is to improve efficiency in how the energy is used in everything that we do. Um, the second was to electrify energy use in what we, how we do our work and how we live our lives. And the third one was to replace coal and natural gas with uh, wind, solar, green energy, if you will, um, clean energy, let me call it that. I think that's the phrase that are more commonly used now, clean energy um, for the grid electricity. So here's sort of, that's just a summary of what I read. Um, and here are the points that I wanted to be able to discuss a little bit. Um, the document estimates that as of 2015, the total electricity usage, the equivalent, that would include automobile mobility and the uh, actual electrical uses in, in, um, in, in homes and in, in commercial buildings was somewhere between 285 to 380 megawatts. Um, and that's residential, commercial, and mobility. That's how much electricity would be the equivalent usage um, to do what we've been doing, at least as of 2015. And so I had a couple of questions on that one. And that was um, how much has, and I don't know that anyone has the numbers here. So this is kind of to Brett, um, if, if he has some insight. Since that 2015 estimate, how much has the Boulder energy consumption changed? Um, now we've had five years. And what is the trajectory for the next five years? What I'm trying to get at here, Brett, a little bit is, you know, are, are we able to, are we in the right direction? Are we reducing our total electrical equivalent electric usage? Um, or are we kind of running uphill? That is to say, we're actually growing, the city's growing, it's electricity use is growing. So we even have a harder pull, push up the hill, so to speak. Any thoughts? It's been a while since I've looked at the numbers, but as I remember it, the last time I saw them, we are um, we are flat or maybe slightly decreasing around residential energy use, electricity use, but increasing around the commercial side. Um, our per capita use is is trending in the right direction, but I think one of the things that um, you know, plays into this discussion is what is the source of the of the electrons that you're using. So yes, conservation is always an important thing to try to emphasize. But I think more of the emphasis has been heading towards changing the the source energy. You know, in other words, reducing the amount of energy generated by coal and natural gas. So sort of to Paul's comments from earlier, it's really important that we be focusing on that. I also just while I'm talking to say this whole issue of the um, the balance of energy and where it's coming from is really going to be one of the centerpieces of the Excel partnership citizen advisory group and so while I think it is certainly an interest area of the of the environmental advisory board it's going to be an explicit focus of that partnership group so just wanted to make sure that everyone's aware that there's yet another city advisory group that's gonna be working quite extensively on that. Got it. Um, maybe like, let's take some other inputs on this, this topic for the moment. Susan, you had to definitely go. Yeah, I guess as I uh, took a closer look at the 2017 plan, I reflected on all the changes that have taken place since 2017 that I hope are reflected in the 2021 plan. And I just it captured some of those. Number one, the 2017 plan refers frequently to the municipalization of our electricity grid, right? And that's definitely changed. We're now part of the Excel franchise. And as a result, I think we really need to listen to what Paul had to say about, gee, what are we going to do to make sure um, we provide oversight for Excel and the PUC to get to our goals of 100% renewable electricity by 2030 and 100 megabytes, sorry, megawatts of um, locally produced electricity. Mm -hmm. And so that's one change. Uh, two change, and, uh, and I invite others to like come up with these changes, is that the cost of renewables has come down so significantly since 2017 that it's actually more cost effective than fossil-based generation. And so that should make a significant plan in our 2021 climate plan. Um, number three, of course, 
probably should have been number one, and that's accelerating climate change, right? Even in 2017, it didn't seem as dire as it clearly is right now. And, and Brett, I know that you know, you have in, in the first introduction that we went over a couple of months ago, you pointed that out. Um, but I, I'm constantly pulling my hair out that we're talking about things like environmental stewardship, which is awesome. But that's kind of like saying, hey, my front yard needs mowing, but my house is on fire. <laughs> right. You know, like this is uh, climate action is what we need right now relative to accelerating climate change. Um, other things that have changed is both Colorado and the United States, as a result of having a new administration, we're in a much friendlier environment with regard to investing not only in renewable energy, but big changes to our transportation system. And I hope to see that reflected in the 2021 plan. Um, number five is COVID. COVID has changed so much. It's the reason we're meeting online here tonight, right? It's the reason people don't have to commute to work every day. And I think taking advantage of some of the opportunities that COVID has given us to learn how to do things more virtually um, could have great benefits environmentally. And I hope we address that in the 2021 plan. And last but not least is just increased density in Boulder. You know, I'm driving across the United States right now. I've currently made it to Santa Fe. Yesterday I came through Oklahoma and I was in a city called Ada, Oklahoma, which is just buildings all the way out to the sidewalk and no trees. And downtown Ada, it was 87 degrees. And when I got just outside of Ada, where there's actually rolling hills and grasslands and trees, the temperature dropped to 77 degrees. It was so poignant to me that the whole issue of heat islands and the impact of density on our, cli our, our very local climate is huge. And that's why I think it is important for us in our climate plan to get more involved with more green biophilic development, because I think that has now become a critical part uh, in Boulder and around the world of our climate action. So those are some things I, that have really changed since 2017 that I'd like to see us embrace in, in the new plan. That's great, Susan. Th yeah, thanks for those thoughts. We'll, we're gonna come back to a couple of them that you called out uh, very nicely stated. Um, Miriam, do you have some thoughts on, on this topic? Not specifically. I mean, I'm looking forward to seeing what, what Brett has to do. I mean, we've already heard snippets of, of what is being presented for the 2021 plan. Um, and I know the city has already done an extensive amount of work on this. Um, and I'm looking forward to, to seeing uh, more about what the city has done towards this. <laughs> yeah, definitely. All right, Miriam, we'll, we'll come back. We'll circle around again because there's a few more elements that are really intriguing in the 2017. Ernan, I know you, you know, your expertise is efficiency and, and um, architectural design. Um, maybe you have some particular views on this question of, you know, which is number one on their three parallel activities, the, the energy usage reduction by increased efficiency. I think you're on mute, that's okay. Yep. It should be lower, it should be in the lower left hand corner of the screen if you move your. Right. <clears throat> Mine is when I click on my image in the upper right hand corner, there's a mute or a mute, a little blue. Yeah. Oh, Heidi, are we having, Heidi, are we, we may have uh, the mute on. Okay, hold on, for, for who? For Hernan. Oh. It's kind of the hazing we do for new members. <laughs> okay, okay. There Sorry, uh, Heidi, I also have my chat. Okay, good. I found my chat disabled. And I couldn't unmute myself. Yeah, you know, I'm so sorry. I didn't when you so, um, I completely. Um, yeah, you need to dial in with Jerry Miller. When you <laughs> logged back in, I forgot to make you a co-host again. And so for um, for 
for participants speaking at public participation, we typically only allow them to unmute themselves during that portion of the meeting. Okay, okay. Well, actually, uh, so I was listening to all the stuff you were that you guys were saying, and um, I guess what I would like to discuss more is, and I think this goes back to what Brad said in the last meeting, is like, what is what we as a city can do realistically to address these problems? And I was almost thinking like going in a different direction is like, should we propose a budget to lobby the state to be like, because if we cannot achieve something as a city, maybe we can achieve it at the county or state level. But I wonder if, I don't know if it's even legal, but yeah, set up a lobby budget so the city can go and you know lobby the state for changes that we don't we cannot necessarily implement just ourselves we need like a bigger budget and that will be more like at the state level i don't know what do you think about that brad i don't know if there's something that has been ever proposed or discussed or if it's a dumb idea <laughs> oh i i'd like to i'm gonna do a, a global response to all the things that are said but i've just written down I have, I have some thoughts for you on that that's a really interesting idea okay okay um yeah i think that's all i want to say for now <laughs> well, we'll, we'll come back to this and that's actually an interesting point it never crossed my mind um that's the scientist to me i suppose you know it's just kind of grind grind forward but that's a really interesting thought so here's another aspect that I read that I wondered um, about. Um, according to the report, um, as of 2015, 17 megawatts of installed solar existed in Boulder, which at that time was a meeting about, locally meeting about 5% of the total electricity need. And that that's also um, accounting for the mobility electrification equivalent. Um, and it goes on to estimate though, the, the report, that Boulder rooftop generation capacity is over 500 megawatts. And it struck me that it, as of 2015, the total electricity consumption, including mobility, was much less than 500 megawatts. So it struck me that, hey, you know, could this, is it, back to Hernan's use of the word, what is realistic? Is it realistic that the city could really ramp up um, its incentives or its its you know its advocacy for building out a a solar production capacity to help meet the um, electrification needs. Um, now I think that 17 megawatts struck me as a small number. I think a lot has changed since 2015. And back to Brett. Number one, do you know roughly where we are today and, and, and where are we in terms of achieving something close to 500 megawatts if that is actually within the reach according to the report? Yeah, so um, I wanna just illustrate a point here um, around the numbers. So to, to quickly to your point, so we had 17 megawatts then. We've been pushing really hard on that since that time. I think we're over 50 now. We, we've, I mean, there's been a lot of movement in the marketplace. The city's done a lot. So we're, I think we're on task or on track to hit our targets there. But, and I think, you know, there's a lot of people who've said, well, we should just put more money into solar. And it's the same issue really around the issue of electrification. So it's really useful if you just think about how many structures there are and how much it costs. So in the case of solar, let's just say that, um, we only needed to spend $10,000 per structure to actually get solar in place. There's 40,000 uh, single family structures in Boulder, that's $400 million. So it's not like there's any way that the city has enough money to do that. And that the expenditure that we're even calling on individuals to make in many cases is beyond their means or beyond their current priorities. So it gets back to this issue that Hernan was talking about, which is how do we move whole systems? And so in the case of electrification, I think maybe Susan's heard me say this. We, one of the, we did this very extensive process in 2015, 16, where we looked at how, what, what it would take to enable all the houses in Boulder to switch from natural gas to electricity. And it was an extremely instructive process because we built 
one of the first and most prominent um, incentive systems around heat pump based, high efficiency heat pump based electrification. And we increased adoption by 400% in that effort, which meant that we went from 50 installations a year to 200 installations a year. And we need to have something more like 1500 to 2000 a year if we're really talking about making that shift. And so we really need to be thinking about this as a sort of society-wide infrastructure reinvestment and how you mobilize the capital in the market to make that happen. And some of us have suggested, for example, around electrification, that we should make the utility pay for that process because it's ultimately going to build their base. So rather than making it this enormous financial choice that I have to make personally and that I don't really get to reap the whole benefits of because I probably won't be in my house for 30 years, you associate that expense to the structure and let each successive owner of that structure carry part of that cost. So I think that there are these strategies that we can employ for making this infrastructure change, but it, it, we've thought in the past, I think we've over relied on this notion, if I can just get Hernan to do this, then everything will happen. No, a lot of times that's creating too much of a burden on a single individual and a single owner. Brett, that's helpful. And I'm gonna to go to Susan right away. Susan, in your hands up, I see you there. Um, Brett, you know, I've seen, as we've all seen, housing developments since 2015 in, in the Boulder area, uh, infills and, and some more substantial. But I don't see solar as being on all of those. Um, does the city require new builds to actually, at least for their new build, let the builder pay or require the builder to provide and have it folded into the costs, I guess, of that structure or somehow or another, their new build to have solar. Yeah, in Boulder, we have, we, in 2014, we set in motion a code updating process, which arrives at basically a net zero requirement for all major remodels and new constructions by 2031. And so it's already getting to the place. In fact, there's a threshold now, it might be a 3000 foot square foot structure where you basically can't build it without making it net zero. And so that might be with solar or any number of other different passive house design or what have you. So we're, we're in, the, in the transition to that. But Susan, did you wanna make some comment around this? Yeah, it, it's hard to get to net zero without doing solar, but some people are still doing it. I see, I see that kind of development in my neighborhood. And the fact of the matter is, at least according to Carolyn Elam is, you know, most people, there are very few houses being built in Boulder that are less than 3,000 square feet. Right. However, commercial buildings, which generate, I can't remember the percentages now. I think residences, there's something like 30% and commercial buildings are like the rest and apartments count as commercial buildings. And we all know that there are lots of apartment buildings going up in Boulder don't have kind of the same requirements. And I think there's an opportunity for improvement there. But I also wanted to comment on what Ernan was saying, and that is basically, um, there are many things that we should be doing at the state level. In fact, Boulder is it's currently um, intervening in the electric resource plan with the PUC, um, because that's super important for us in order for us to reach our goals. In fact, there is legislature that's being put forth by Steve Benberg right now to get us past the 120% limit, the limit to how much solar you can put on your house, which is based on 120% of what you did the uh, what you used the year before, so that it opens up, opens things up to people actually putting more solar on their house. And I I, I do think that being more active in at least state, if not federal, kinds of restrictions that are hamstringing us in terms of being able to take the kind of aggressive climate action we'd like to um, is super important. Thanks, Susan. Miriam, do you have any thoughts on some of that? I'm familiar with the county, at least, I, and I would imagine the city participating in most uh, statewide legal AQCC actions, um, anything related to um, the city's involved. I, I know they are because I hear them speaking and, and providing input and comment all the time. So I, it's um, I'm I, I would like to hear what Brett has to say as far as you know how the the 
the city is participating in government action or communication with Excel or, or whatever. I'm sure it's quite extensive. Um, <laughs> but uh, I mean, yes, all, all of the comments that everybody's making are, are very valuable. And um, and yes, we I, I think we have much to do to, to make our uh, electrification of the city more viable. Um, and I think that the city of Boulder is really working hard to make that happen. Maybe Marty, I could just pick up a few of these comments and then so but to so to turn on to your point, yes, that we actually have been very actively engaging in policy advocacy at both the state and federal level. And the city actually retains a lobbyist in Washington, DC, as well as lobbyists at the state. So it's it's very legal and it's a part of the business. But I think we have been having the same conversation internally, which is that given the pace of change that has to happen and the scale of change that has to happen, we increasingly think that policy work may be one of the most important places for us to engage um, as opposed, not as opposed to, but balanced against things like local incentive programs to sponsor energy efficiency, which you know just hit a very few number of properties. I wanna make sure I do say that um, we had actually hoped to bring to you the draft of the memo that we're taking to council uh, for the June 8th meeting uh, for this session. We weren't quite ready to do that. So you're gonna get that in this next month. And then we'll discuss that at the next meeting. It's not gonna be a plan. I just wanna prepare you for this. It's going to be an update on our current strategy development because we're working on that full plan that we'll be bringing to council in December. But part of why we're not trying to bring a plan is because we're really gonna propose essentially a very significant shift in how we approach climate action very much in keeping with what you've been saying which is that we we have to move beyond kind of just locally focused essentially incremental efforts and think about how we're going to help support larger systems change and we think that means some different approaches than we've had in the past so that's going to be the essence of that i do want to note that one of the things that has changed and susan i thought your list was really great um, between when we wrote that last plan and now is the recognition that the energy systems are still a very important driving factor of climate change, but, but they are by no means the only thing. And as you were saying, our, our, our natural landscapes are also a significant part of this, both how we've decarbonized landscapes through how we farm and, and ranch and things, and also the ways that landscapes could be a part of taking carbon back out. And then yeah. we've also dramatically underestimated the contributions that consumption and material economies are contributing. And that we now sort of see that each of these three areas, energy systems, ecosystems, and material economy are contributing roughly a third to this process. And so one of the issues around this is that our accounting systems for greenhouse gases really are biased towards looking at energy systems and they don't well capture these other effects. Mm -hmm. So that's another area where we're having to think about consumption-based emissions accounting and other elements that give us a better picture of what we're doing. So just to interrupt real quick on this. So what you're saying is the accounting is almost exclusively looking at the sources, not the sinks. Not just that, but also it's not even capturing all the sources adequately. Oh, okay. Susan? Yeah, I, I, the way my 27 year old son puts it is, mom, it's not enough to think about net zero. You need to be thinking about regenerative systems if you really want to create the world that you want your grandchildren to live in. I don't have grandchildren yet, but <laughs> and I hope I don't for a little while yet. But you know, net zero is kind of how we were thinking about it. And I think regenerative is how we, it's, it's not just accounting for what we're putting into the air, like Brett's saying, it's like, how do we get back to enabling the earth to regenerate itself? Yeah, and, and uh, very much to your point, and and to what you've been working and promoting before, Miriam, we'll, um, we'll, I'll follow up with you about the biophilic aspect. Um, I kind of gave that to planning. To, they, we had a really good meeting with the biophilic group, and I think that we're going to get more active in that. Um, so I'm super interested in that. So I'd love to be a part of that if there's any way to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so and I think. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there for now. But those those are some responses to the questions raised. Hi, Michael. Hi, Mike. Just a 
recap, we're, we're kind of going through the energy part, the energy section of the 2017 Climate Action Plan. And uh, you know, we started some discussion about really the elect electrification and the different strategies. Um, and so we're kind of going around the, um, the, the board for their thoughts. And um, I'm gonna to go to Hernan here, who's next in line and, 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 and Mike, uh, I'll catch you next after Hernan has a chance to uh, provide some of his thoughts. Okay, awesome, thanks. Hi Mike, yeah, you bet. Hernan, did, did you wanna add something more? Uh, no, not at the time. I think uh, I already said um, what I thought and um, my ideas. Because I feel like in terms of like building codes, I feel that's, I mean, in the right path. I don't feel like there's any major change there to do, honestly. Um, and you know, something that a, basically a different department handles, you know, they have the, you have the building code department, uh, the city. Um, so yeah, I mean, I just, I think I would like to just focus on, yeah, just what is realistic for us as a city to achieve and then uh, what is not realistic for us as a city to achieve, try to, you know, build policies that we can push at the state level. That's, I think that's, yeah, my main idea right now. Um, Susan, can I come back to you in just a minute? Um, I, I'm looking at the time here, so I wanna be mindful of the agenda. Um, just one more point I wanted to raise, and this will get back to policy, I think. Um, and, and that is, so there was a third element um, in the electrification, and that was to do with the um, charging stations. So the opportunity for folks to um, move out of the gas vehicle and into an electric vehicle. Now, leaving aside for the moment, the cost aspects may not make sense. It may not be realistic as Hernan, like you say, a lot of people can't afford to go elect electric, but that may change. In fact, I, I'm sure it will change. Hopefully it'll change quickly. Um, but the question it really is um, charging stations. And according to my read, uh, somewhere I writ had written down there, um, there weren't that many charging stations at 2015. Um, I don't see it here in my notes exactly how many. Um, but I guess my, my question, this comes back to Brett, is number one, um, do we roughly know how many of our residents have electric vehicles versus gas? Um, and how can the city, and maybe it's not the city's ability to do this, back to Hernan's point, to incentivize individuals um, to more rapidly adopt electric mobility? And then the third element, and this is policy, uh, the new federal infrastructure plan, if it gets approved, is to do a massive scale um, recharge station um, investment. And, um, and I'm wondering how Boulder would, would benefit or how it's positioning in, itself to advocate for being part of that. I imagine that's occurring through a state level interaction. So Brett, maybe to start things off and then, then Mike afterwards. Oh, I'm sorry, I should get the order right. Susan and then Mike. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, I, I can't remember the number exactly. I remember when we were doing the plan in 2015 and I, I think there was maybe there's probably less than a dozen charging stations in town. And we were like, you know, we were cheering every time we got one more. <laughs> and I saw a number recently, I can't remember, it was the last couple of months. I mean, it's, it's, it's gone up by almost an order of magnitude just in the last five years. So lots of progress there. But as you're saying, Marty, and I think this is really an important piece, and it's one of the themes that you're going to hear in this report that we give you is the notion of a sort of city-centric climate action approach has in a certain kind of way taken the focus off the the need the, the, the fact that we have to have federal level action and state level action to be able to get the scale of change. And so that's what's exciting about this moment of when we have an administration that wants to make this move, we will see some really exciting big steps in that direction. I do also just want to make sure I say because uh, Susan said something else that was important I wanted to note. We were thinking about resilience in 2015. We were thinking about equity in 2015, but you'll see that those are now more like fundamentals in our new plan. And in fact, the notion of climate action in the past was just about emissions reduction. We're saying that climate action now must be essentially defined as both 
mitigation, emissions reduction, adaptation and resilience, and how we're accomplishing that in equitable ways. So I think these are really significant changes that have come just since the last plan has been put together. Mm -hmm. Susan? Oh, I, it, it may be a late, late comment now, but Arnon mentioned, well, building codes were kind of like moving in the right direction, but I think it's not just building code, it's land development and urban planning mm -hmm. practices that have to be an important part of that resiliency and climate action and towards equity, because a lot of the development that we've seen recently um, is driven by some, you know, new urbanism kind of concepts. And by the way, new urbanism is about 50 years old <laughs> that are pretty out of sync with what we're dealing with in terms of climate change right now. So it needs to go beyond building codes and into land use and development. Mike? Yeah, uh, so I don't, I'm a little still not quite sure exactly what you're talking about. Well, one thing that I thought was really interesting, Brett, was in the, I'm trying to find it, in the study session stuff, can we, is that where we're talking about too, or just the 2017? We're in a 2017, but, but feel free to go where you want on that. But we were looking at the, okay. the energy section um, okay. and the core action areas um, in the 2017 document. Okay, yeah, I've got that open too. Okay, we'll come back. I've got some, I wanted to see something about the other one, but um, I'll come back to that. Largely, I mean, I, I still feel like, I want to talk a little bit more about the electric vehicle thing. I still don't like have a sense of, you gotta get confused. Like, I don't have a sense of like, if I think about how many gas stations exist in like the city of Boulder, right? Versus like, I don't have a sense for like how, what's the number for like how many charging stations per, is there like a metric that you try to meet that like people have figured out for like, so I look around, like I can think of like within my, a mile, half a mile of my house, there's so many gas stations, right? And like, to me, do 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 people assume that like seventy five percent of people are going to charge their stuff at home and not need to charge during the day? And they're like, what is that metric? And like, is it yeah. reasonable to try to hit? I, I would think you're really trying to hit the folks that commute into Boulder to do their work in Boulder and then have to go home. Then have to go, home, but they'd have to be, and that exceed the range of a typical car. Is that like how do you even calculate it? I just have always struggled with that understanding of like what that would really look like if it was built out. Brett, do you? Well, it's Brett, really is there a new transportation master plan? that just got approved. Maybe we should have somebody from TAB come and do a little presentation on that. Because I think a lot of the questions you're asking are in that transportation. Are they in there? Okay. Although I haven't uh, reviewed the newest one. The, the thing is that the, the, the dynamics, the questions that you're asking, Mike, are changing, are being changed by the rapid advancements in the technologies themselves. Okay. So, it's a really different thing when, you're, when your range is maybe 100 uh, miles per charge, which is where it was in 2015, to the where we are now. And what's coming is cars that are going to have a three, four, 500 mile range. And so one of the real significant issues, and I don't think anybody's quite figured this out yet, is there are lots of, of dwellings in Boulder, for example, especially the multifamily unit dwellings, where it's not, there's no easy charging fix right away. Yeah, yeah, really yeah. significant infrastructure development. But there are these now fast charging strategies coming forward and more and more of the vehicles that are being made are prepared for these fast charging stations where in you know, 10 or 15 minutes, you can get these multi hundred mile charges. Okay. So I don't think that there's an easy solution or formula yet because the technology is changing so fast. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. I've just like never been able to wrap my head around like what yeah. it would look like to have if everyone had a car like an electric vehicle like yeah. how that would look you know or if ever like 75 percent of people did i think what if everyone had an electric vehicle and it was actually part of our storage system mm -hmm. to enable us to have battery systems in our homes that stored energy from our rooftops i mean that's the kind of bigger thinking that we need to get into mm. Yeah, I was just hearing about this new F-150 truck that they're building, which is going to be available in the next couple of years. I mean, it's got a massive battery to it. So this whole vehicle to grid thing completely changes when you're talking about batteries, the sizes that they're putting in some of these vehicles. So, hmm. so I, I think, think I, still, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say the other thing I always think about reading through this plan is the housing part. And I know we've talked a lot about this before, but I just 
get so worried about like housing is already so expensive you know and here and i just worry about like is like how do you really pay for this and how do you really make it affordable and how do you not make housing already more difficult and stressful and make our can, can, like just price people out right and maybe like lose other interesting and good parts of a community so that everyone can gain a little bit of efficiency or something you know what i mean i just worry about that too and like I don't know that necessarily how you balance that belongs in here, but it's always a concern to me. It's always something that I think of, you know? Um, yes. And I think uh, Susan referred to it earlier. When we first went out to the community in 2019 to try to start this new climate action cycle planning just before COVID, and we took the, the original three climate action focus areas, which were energy ecosystems and resources, the community came back and said, yeah, but there's two others we want you to really look at. One is the role of the economy and financial systems in driving climate change, and the other was land use. So I think that these are very active uh, themes. I know it's a, it's a theme that Lynn and others bring forward as important considerations um, that I think it it's, needs to be on the table. Yeah, I think so. And like, I, you know, you've talked before, Brett, about that idea of like it being paid for kind of at the meter and dispersed across whoever the homeowner is uh, over. Yeah. And like, that's such a cool idea, right? Like, so I, and I think that comes back to that notion that we've talked about the switch from like the individual to the massive systemic change, right? And when I read these type of things, I keep, you know, since we've talked about more about that in the presentation you gave us and thinking more about that and the nature and timelines, like I, I really do think that that's sort of the way we need to be heading like those big things are so critical. So well, when yeah. you think about, for example, the electric grid and what we had to do as a society to make electricity available to everyone, it was one of those problems that you couldn't solve at an individual level. Right. It's why we basically created the, the phenomena of a regulated monopoly because we needed entities that could aggregate enough capital to deploy huge amounts of, of infrastructure. It's the reason we created the Rural Electric Association so that they could do that kind of thing too. I think we need to be thinking about the 21st century version of these kind of publicly controlled capital concentrations that retrofit a whole bunch of infrastructure very quickly. I agree and it's like such a great opportunity to create employment for people right. and wealth and yeah. yeah. So I, I just wanted to mention, I, I sat in on uh, the consultant's presentation on the development at Alpine Balsam, where that uh, hospital used to be that Lynn referred to. And I just was actually super encouraged relative to the kinds of new technology they were talking about. They were talking about using, let's see, sewer heat recovery. There's a sewer line that runs down Broadway that could provide substantial heat if they had a district energy kind of system where people were sharing heat and electricity at that site. And it's an opportunity because the city owns that property to have way more affordable housing than ever before um, or at, at other sites. And so as the EAB, I think getting involved in major developments like that, because we don't have that many spaces of land around Boulder where we're gonna have like really the ability to have a big impact in terms of embracing new energy and all kinds of new technology mm -hmm. uh, you know like we should be behind that and helping with that i think that's a really cool point susan like i like that idea of like those type of bigger things that like make that whole area and that new development like and you know sewer heat recovery biophilic <laughs> Well, I would just say real quickly and that we probably should be moving um, th that we're going to one of the things that is becoming clearer and clearer as we get into an era in which the the reality of climate change is becoming more and more imposing is that local government is where climate change really manifests. I mean, it doesn't really happen at the federal level. It happens at a local level. And that we're going to find, I think, over time that more and more of our resources have to be committed to the recovery from and the preparation for change, as opposed to, or not necessarily as opposed to, but this is why finding solutions that can intersect both climate stabilization and preparing for and responding to climate change is going to, are going to be really important. Okay, that's a great discussion. Uh, good ending point for now. Will we continue that? Will we have an opportunity next month to? Go a little bit further into the document or will we be moving on to the new 
uh, we'll be moving on to the new. Okay, all right. So that was good. I, I think we covered a lot of territory, not all of it in there to be sure, but that was good. Well, I just would call out that one of the things that I think you'll see is in 2015, we were thinking about ecosystems and we were starting to think about the material economy, but most of our discussion, most of our focus was on that energy systems piece. I think you'll see some maturing and evolving of those other two areas in this new document. But I'm really glad that you had a chance to kind of dig into this because I think it'll provide a useful contrast in now thinking about what this next plan looks like. Great. Yeah, and thanks everyone. That was a good discussion. On the air quality, um, update air quality efforts. Um, before we jump in there, and I, I presume we'll hear from, from Marion and, and Brett on this in particular, um, I wanted to just sort of touch on, I, I sent an email out for a um, seminar that was hosted through Stanford Seminar Series. Um, it, was, it was actually harder to get into that talk and listen than I had assumed it would be. You needed to have a papal dispensation, as it turns out, to be able to log in. Um, and uh, so they sent me a link to the talk afterwards and then, and then I watched it. And so this was a talk on air quality and health. And I just wanted to real briefly highlight what I took away from the talk and hopefully it'll connect with some of our um, air quality efforts and concerns that we have locally. The talk was given by a, a Dr. Mary uh, Pernicki and she's from the uh, Sean Parker um, Center for Allergy and Asthma Research. So she her expertise is knowing how lungs and the, and the whole um, a body system responds to the effects of smoke. And what, what I took away from this, and this is a, a person from California, so they've been really under the gun from smoke exposure. And so that's why this is such an um, important topic for them. Um, that uh, you know, PM 2.5 was what she mainly talked about, which is 80% of wildfire smoke, as, uh, as I was told in the talk. I didn't realize it was quite that high. 80% of wildfire smoke consists of PM 2.5. And it's PM 2.5 that is especially problematic, um, as was discussed, um, it, because it penetrates deeper into the lungs uh, than, than the larger um, particulates and enters the bloodstream quite readily. And so they had some nice illustrations of this. Of course, we think of people with asthma and pre-existing conditions that are especially vulnerable. And I was so, so surprised to see the presentation and later the Q&A go to the young folks and kids and school-age kids. And it really went there and the evidence that she presented about how kids ages six to eight and how their cell functions were fairly quickly compromised by being exposed to the types of loads from the fires that are not uncommon in, in California. And so the uh, discussion came about concerning standards for monitoring uh, PM 2.5 and, and also for sort of uh, cleansing the air, if you will, in facilities, in particular schools. So the, the Q&A part was all about schools <laughs> and um, filtration and air systems for cleaning and protecting youngsters. Um, they talked about options that included N95 masks. That was quickly dismissed. It wasn't practical uh, to use Arnon's phrase. It really doesn't make sense. You can't imagine a six and 70 year old wearing, wearing um, N95 masks. Um, air purifiers in classrooms, HVAC and clean room safety was sort of the main uh, uh, feeling that that was a good, good source of uh, providing protection in the case of exposure to PM 2.5. Interestingly enough, California, of all the fires, they said they have no measures of air quality in schools. There's no monitoring. There's no baseline. They really don't know how bad it is in their wow, school that's system. Wild. That's I was surprised. Don't... Yeah. That I was surprised. Um, and so the talk was about a need for uniform air quality measurement in the school system. Uh, that it didn't exist surprised me too, uh, Mike. So those are just the highlights. Um, and um, Maybe just move on to the agenda item and see if any of that dovetails to some of the things that you want to share on our air quality efforts here. Maybe I can start it out and okay. have Miriam um, uh, complete it. Uh, this is again, I want to start by just offering uh, deep gratitude to Miriam for really continuing to push this piece forward and to offer not as an excuse, but just as an explanation that we are as a department understaffed at the moment, and also that the city organization 
is not only also struggling with the same issue, but that air quality falls into a gap that no city department really covers. So we're still struggling to figure out how to effectively respond to this important issue and the, and the sort of um, guidance and leadership that I think that you guys are providing here. So with that though, I, I would say that we're continuing to explore how the city can engage in and support maybe two major tracks of effort here. One is how do we improve the awareness and the information getting to the community and especially in the context of getting to all aspects of the community. And the other is how do we uh, find ways to build the capacity of our community to respond effectively to that information, especially again, the most vulnerable and most at risk. And so Miriam has been providing guidance in thinking about both of those, um, but that's kind of the, the, the key areas that I think we're now um, trying to narrow in on. I would just say, and I don't know I've said, if I've said this to you, Miriam, I've been talking a lot about this issue with Jonathan Cohen, our director, and how we could, st could staff this. And we do have a, a sort of open position, a, an unfilled position in our in our department around resilience. Um, part of the issue that we're having right now is that we don't. Jonathan is in, is in an acting role as a director, and so it's it isn't yet clear whether he's going to assume that role as a permanent position or not. And until that is decided, it's hard to actually allocate some of these other open positions. But we, we Jonathan and I both believe that. We will eventually figure out how to staff that resilience person and that th that will be the position that will probably really take fo this issue forward. So I'm, I'm playing inadequately right now the sort of um, support role for this. But so with that, um, that was a whole lot of qualifications and I don't need to be apologizing. Go ahead. Um, I just I don't have a ton more to add, but um, I've been still participating in the regional air quality messaging and monitoring meetings. Um, they, uh, to my surprise, have not been as focused on the equity piece of it, and I and I brought that to um, to Brett's attention, and we'll try to bring that more forward to the regional group um uh, uh, they've actually asked me to bring it forward so i guess i will um <laughs> it's surprising that the rest of the group is is not addressing this um but what one of the things that brett and i have talked about is is maybe finding a person to contract out to from city of boulder that can help um city of boulder appropriately um communicate and uh, basically find the uh, the right people to um, address the air quality problem in a way that people can understand uh, what the problem is and how they can help themselves. And so it, it'll be a process uh, uh, where we, we find the person who's able to assist the city in that way. Um, but uh, it, it hopefully we'll start fairly soon that we can we can start that ball rolling um in the meantime uh michael ogletree from um from city of denver is moving forward with creating the data platform that will be shareable among all of the diff different regional cities and counties um that will be able to be accessed at from you know from their various websites if they want to have that information available um and that information can be localized as we talked about before so um uh that's that's just a starting point you know where we have the data and the information about what is happening available and then i've also talked to brett about you know creating just having a landing point where we can have resources available, you know, from, you know, an internet standpoint, but, you know, there will be other ways that we can communicate the availability of resources to other communities that aren't accessing the, the website or other means as well. Miriam, yeah. thanks. Uh, Brett, do you want to follow up or 
Uh, I just want to speak, which is that um, you all might remember that we had a presentation from a graduate student team that was doing a project on air quality. And they have um, apparently come up with a with a pretty impressive set of final recommendations. So I'm I'm working to get that and get that both back to Miriam and to all of you, because they had apparently some really interesting ideas around how to resource um, access to air filtration systems for you know people who are at risk, which. To be honest with you, that is my biggest concern at this point, which is this next fire season and the parts of our, the, the members of our community who don't have easy access to expensive air filters or what have you. And I feel like that's where we've really got to focus to make sure that gap is at least addressed as much as possible. So anyway, I'll get that back out to you. And I think it's, I, I would suggest that we just keep this as an ongoing topic in our agendas to keep moving this, pro this process forward. Thanks, Brett. I'm going to end up going through reverse order this time. I'll go Mike, then Hernan, and then Susan. Uh, just a quick comment. Um, so last month, we, we kind of talked about monitoring, which is still an issue, as we just heard. Um, that, 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 that's still a challenge. Um, but then also the HVAC clean room, if you will, the clean room space, a, a safe zone. Um, this, came, this was a big topic in the talk that I listened to, and again, surprising how poorly prepared it seemed to be. Right, and and I've actually brought that forward to Brett as well as as part of the actions that should be taken um, for the city. They should that we should identify safe spaces that are public spaces, you know, community centers, um, religious buildings, schools, where we can create safe spaces and and enable places where people can go. Yeah. Yeah. No. Exactly. And this, of course, this this was an issue. The schools were of great concern in the presentation from the California person, and um, and a few schools had actually been canvassed to figure out whether they actually have the requisite uh, standard for HVAC and and clean room safety zones within their school systems. So, so I think I think something that's really interesting, Marty, is that. Um, a lot of schools have updated their HVAC systems enormously because of COVID. And, and so I think if, yeah. we, <laughs> if we look at what has been done in the schools, we will be pleasantly surprised about, you know, the ability to meet the, the filtering needs. Um, but I mean, sh certainly we should, it should be reviewed and, and understood. Yeah, that's you know, really what good is point. the capability. Really good point. So maybe we're taking care of two problems at once, hopefully. Yeah, I, yeah. silver lining. Great. Mike, um, let's, let's start with you, Mike, and then we'll go to Ernan and Susan. I mean, I think um, the, the two things that, you know, I think about when I think about this is I think the safe space idea and the clean room and like the place for people to go is the most important, I think, in my mind. I think um, more so in my mind than the monitoring to some degree, because I feel like I think the monitoring of schools is important, but I think, you know, if pe people are going to know it's smoky at some point, whether or not it's monitored. And if it's a point, if it gets bad enough, they're going to want to seek a safe space. So I guess that's sort of that safe space and that clean space for people to go to is really important in my mind. And then the second thing I like, I was thinking the other day about like, you know, I don't know, is there like a better for like, a, for like my furnace at home, is there a better filter I can put in my system that I don't have in my system that's not ridiculously expensive? And like, where do I find that information? And Right, that's the kind of information we're gonna try to make available to people. So I think that's super yeah. awesome. Like, I was just like, I don't know, actually, you know what I think about it? Like, is there, I don't wanna spend $5,000 for something super fancy, but like, mm -hmm. is there one that I could spend 80 bucks and, and you know, or $25 more when I replace the filter in my furnace and it does a better job come fire season? And, you know, and is a little safer and I have no freaking idea. So it'd be awesome. Right. To that, you know? um, and then I like the idea, you know, I really like that idea. And then I like the idea of like having a place for people to go when it gets really bad, um, whose houses are leaky and, and don't go, or if they're just by proximity in a place where they're closer to the fire, maybe not evacuated, but it, the smoke is just unbearable and dangerous and they have elderly family, you know? So I think those are the two things that I really think of as important um, when it comes to this. Yeah, okay, that's great. You know, I was thinking when you mentioned furnaces, um, my house happens to be all electric, which which was not a good selling point when I bought it. People said, oh, you know, we're sorry, we don't have gas in this house, but they didn't extend the line, you know, through that part of the neighborhood. Now, of course, it goes the opposite. 
I, I don't like gas. I wouldn't want it in my house. But because I have all electric baseboard or, or now solar, whatever I do, um, I don't have a furnace. There you go. That's perfect. And yeah. I wonder, is that generally going to be true if we retrofit houses to be all electric that we would also be removing their I don't know. Or I look, and I'll be so mad if someone tries to take my gas stove. I'd be so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, this is, a good, this is a good question for Hernan. I mean, do we lose our ability to filter our air if we replace, you know, uh, re, you know, um, redesign our homes to be all electric? Don't take my stove, Hernan. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had the same thought because I did have a gas line installed in my kitchen because I like gas better than electric uh -huh. so, <laughs> so i don't know i guess you will always i mean i i think gas is still like especially for kitchens it's still it's gonna be hard to but i mean still you know i think most of your gas most of your electricity will go towards like heating and cooling so uh i think you will still need a uh, filter because you're still recycling air through your furnace regardless of whether um, you have gas or not I will think. Well, most I think where we're heading generally in the the space conditioning in buildings is towards heat pumps, but those heat pumps can either be um, isolated, what they call mini split units, which are separate individual units, or they can have a central air function. So there's a drop in replacement for natural gas furnaces that Mitsubishi produces. That's a heat pump. Um, it fits into houses of up to uh, about 1500 square feet. And so, but this is actually a really interesting example of an intersectional opportunity because we have all these houses in Boulder that have central air gas furnaces. And we have all these houses that don't have air conditioning. And we have all these houses that may not have air filtration. So if you could put a heat pump based system into these houses and use their existing ducting systems, you could have a high efficiency electric based system that actually also has the capacity to filter your indoor air. And I think that it could turn out to be that heat pumps, the, the adoption of heat pumps is driven more by the need for cool, clean air than it is by anything else. Interesting. Yeah, that's interesting to think about. Mm -hmm. I'd never thought about that like that. Yeah. Aaron, you had, you had some more thoughts there? Nope. Thanks. No, no, no. Thank you. Appreciate it. And uh, and you you can you can have my stove, but it's electric. <laughs> I do I do want to just say the, the the literature is becoming extremely clear on this. One of the single biggest air quality uh, problems in homes is gas cook stoves. Mm. Yeah, I read that recently and I was like, it's worth the risk, man. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't tried, have you tried an induction stove? Have you tried what? an induction stove? I have a gas kitchen stove, yeah. No, but have you tried an, you should, you should go try an induction stove. Yeah, oh, that's what I have. I love it. I'll, I'll, I'll they, are, they are, they are, they are far faster than gas. You have better uh, control over them and they're so much safer, not just the air quality piece, but like, you know, little kids running around a kitchen and you've got gas going. Mm -hmm. I, just open your mind. Open your mind. You might decide that there's. I, lo I love it. Hey, I love I it because I can. I can. That. I gotta check it out. <laughs> I love it because I can burn my dinner much faster than I've ever burned it before. Yeah. Yeah. Susan. Um, I, I think I'm most interested in the intersection between climate change, air quality, and public health. Right. There was a great article in National Geographic. I can't remember if it was last month or the month before where some a woman has been doing research on um, public health as it relates to air quality around the world and has been tracking it for like 20 years. And I think if you can bring it to people's attention that this is really a public health hazard. And I think if we have another summer, I hope we don't like we had last summer, but doesn't does it does anybody remember that it, the sky was smoky for two and a half months it was awful <laughs> almost every day yeah right and yeah. like if if that doesn't spur people to action doesn't spur people to change some behaviors i i i, I just don't know what will
<laughs> you know the the problem is is people don't understand the impacts that that the negative air quality has on them right. in large part and they right. don't understand that it's hurting them i, I also think people yeah. are just like adaptable and to a fault and kind of forget after a couple months and they're like hey, you know i think that's part of it too you know yeah I, but I, I don't know about you but it had an impact on my health it had an impact in my, in my, like oh. throughout the winter i it felt like it. You know, I was congested that I'd been breathing that nasty, smoky air for two and a half months. Yeah, I remember going. Like, I don't want to stay inside. I live in Boulder. I want to go well, outside. Now here, here's a, maybe a small benefit, if I can call it that, of COVID, that we all have masks. Many of us have N95. Maybe we should hold on to them even as COVID wanes away, because those are the kinds of masks that can help you, you know, if you do need to be out and about when there is the particulate. So we're now accustomed we to actually wearing masks. About, or maybe we should get serious about climate action and its relationship to air quality to actually improve our air quality instead. I agree. Of all, all of the above. But there's the, adapt, there's the adaptation part that, that um, Brett mentioned. So, you know, mitigation, adaptation have to go hand in hand. Yep. Yeah. And I, I also wanted to mention, you know, I, I apologize. I have kind of a standing conflict that's this is the last month I have to do this, but I need to depart at 7.30. Um, and my apologies, but I'll be signing off at 7.30. And this is the last month I'll have that conflict. Susan, before you, let's see, we got almost 7.20. Uh, if there are some things you want to bring to our attention before you leave, um, I'll go to Miriam first here, but then we'll circle back just to make sure that we get what you, what's on your mind if you have one to share any more. I did, I wanted to say one thing and that was, um, one thing that is really important about the monitoring is helping people understand when they're in danger when they are not and when it's not present like when the wildfire smoke is not right in their face you know and there are a lot of instances with ozone and particulate that can get at high levels and you wouldn't know it without having some sort of warning mechanism or or ability to see you know the danger through a measurement you know, um, and so I think we shouldn't disregard the monitoring. <laughs> I think it's valuable yeah. uh, for providing warning when it's needed. Um, and so I just want to put that out there. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I see Arnon next. Uh, the monitoring, of course, is always going to be important from a scientific point of view. This is me speaking science language a little bit, but you want to be able to understand what is the relationship between various levels of air quality degradation and human health. And if you don't have the monitor values, you really don't know quite what is the attributable effect. You need to have that information from, from a study and point it, of view. And we're Marty, I think too, like just generally, like we're not in a static period, like everything's changing in the environment and you can't, without monitoring in a changing system, you're kind of hosed when it comes to drawing mechanisms and understanding later when you do want to learn, right? Yep, yep, no, we're on the same page. Good, uh, Ernan. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I will definitely, I'm definitely on the ignorant camp. So like, what are the dangers? Like when we had those um, really bad air quality because of the fires, like what are the long-term effects? Because like short-term, like if I went out, I know I had like issues breathing if I, you know, because I wasn't wearing a mask or anything. I think I went on a run in the middle of, you know, like the sky being orange. And then um, when I go home, I had issues breathing. Um, but then, you know, like, <laughs> the fire went away and breathing issues disappeared after a day. So it's like, what are the long-term effects? Like if you wanna warn people and you want them to be worried, like I, I'm definitely more concerned about the long-term because the short-term like, oh yeah, I have breathing issues, but those go away by tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But like what damage did I do to my body, for example? By yeah, going it, out it, it, it See how many packs cute. of cigarettes I just burned through given just being outside today, you know? <laughs> It can be a cumulative effect, you know, damage is done for one day and then it's not done the next day and then more damage can be done in another day that has a high level of, of pollution. It's, it's, it can be cumulative in your body and it can affect you over time. There's so many more kids with asthma these days because of air quality. It's, it's really a horrible health hazard. Yeah, I think cumulative is a good way of thinking of it. You know, I don't think anyone questions that they would never want to work in a coal mine, right? Because of the lung damage resulting from inhaling cumulatively the fine dust particles. 
And I, and I think, you know, routine and regular exposure, if that's what our future looks like to a lot of uh, small particulates, is like working in a coal mine as part of your night or daytime you know, job, so to speak. No one would choose that for themselves or their families. So that is another way of thinking about it. The cumulative effect is like being in a coal mine if we continue to have summers like we had last summer. So um, the idea will be like, if like get some sort of notification telling me, hey, the air quality is bad today. If you go out, wear a mask or something. Is that the idea? Um, yeah, it'll give you solutions. It'll say the, da the, the health hazard is so bad that you should wear a mask today or the health hazard is so bad you shouldn't be outside today. You need to find a clean airspace inside. I mean, it, it, and that ha happened last year where it was so bad that people should not have been outside. So can the state, I mean, that's, I mean since we're working with the, the city of Denver, could the state send like Amber Alerts style messages? The state you know? does and, and they, I mean, well, I mean, they have their warning mechanism the same and, and they are actually involved in this whole messaging group that, that this regional messaging group as well. You know, they're, they're struggling to get information out to the general public the same way everybody else is. Um, and um, yeah, it's there. And, and part of the point of this group is to try to make the messaging more understandable and how getting to the right people and and you know what is the best message to give people and how to give it to them and it, it's all of that kind of thing and yes and a lot of it will be solutions like you can find a safe space here you can find um filters here you can find you know it, it's solution based yep so so when we've had those fires uh did the state send a warning because it was kind of long ago so i don't remember uh, you you would have had to have looked for it and so, i mean if you're using your phone air quality meter <laughs> it would have told you it's a bad air quality day today you know yeah, it, it would have told you not go hang out yeah like you yeah oh, but i guess i guess that's what i'm getting at like will it be possible for the you know what like i i didn't sign up for amber alerts you know if there's a if like somebody steals a kid, I get a message on my phone right? automatically without even asking for it. So could, could the state use part of the same network or the same messaging system to just be like, hey, you know, the air quality is really bad today. So that way, you know, like everybody, whether you're on iPhone or Android, you get these Amber Alerts. Could you, will it be possible or could it be proposed to do the same well, for air quality, that way, you know, like people part, don't have to download anything. Part of the problem with that is that the air quality is different in different places and, and may be really bad in Boulder, but not so bad in Denver, you know, and, and for the state to put out an alert like that, I don't know. That's why, you know, the different regional bodies or different, you know, sectors kind of have to take care of their own here. Um, I don't think that there is any mechanism to do what you're suggesting. I mean, there, I mean, we've talked about putting a like a flag system, you know, a warning system with flags so that people can see, you know, if it's a red flag, it's a bad day. Like, you know, like the for we talked about this last time, like the forest service does for fire danger, right? It's a, you know, when they put it on the red fire danger, you don't light a fire, right? I mean, <laughs> so it, it, there's lots of ideas going on out there. Um, I, you know, I think your idea is a good one, Arnon, and and I'll bring it to the to the table, you know, to the conversation, and see if there's some way to to do that. But but I don't know if that's something that the state really can take responsibility for because it's not usually a statewide problem. Well, I guess I guess. No. I'm going to jump in real quick and because I want to, sorry, and I will come back. This is a good conversation. I just want to make sure that Susan has uh, anything she wanted to add because we're at 726 on my clock. And Susan, uh, before parting word. <laughs> yeah, in, in four minutes, three things. Um, one is I would like to suggest that in future meetings, we talk a little bit about setting some objectives as a board related to the things that we recommended in our letter to city council. Much as Miriam has made great progress on air quality because we had some objectives she was working towards, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can 
you know, have an objective, for instance, relative to urban heat islands and land use codes. So we're not just talking about it, but we have something that we're really trying to implement. So I'd like to see that in a future agenda. Um, I wanted to mention that in particular with regard to urban heat islands, I'm super interested in biophilic design, Brett, and any way I can get involved in that would be terrific. And one aspect of that that's super important in Boulder right now is our tree canopy. And that might be an, a, a, an objective that, that we can look at. You know, we're losing trees far faster than we are replacing them. Uh, and thanks to tree disease and wildfires. And there's such an important part to re building a regenerative uh, environment that that perhaps is an objective that we could add to the list. And along those same lines, I sent out an email about um, this notion of rights of nature that I would really uh, encourage us to have a presentation from this gentleman, Grant Wilson, who has an organization called Earth Law. And I wondered uh, if, if we don't have time for it now, if people could let me know how they felt about that in email, I, um, we could have him do a 15 minute presentation at a future meeting. So those are my main things. I'm sorry I have to drop off early and um, I'll be back in Boulder in a couple of days. Hey, if I could just follow up real quick, Marty. So yeah. um, Susan, I'm, I'm so glad you've been raising, you're raising that issue around the urban forest. And I wanted to let you know in particular, I'm laying the groundwork for trying to launch a whole major community campaign around urban forestry as a climate action for next year. And so I would love to be talking with you and with and have EAB be a very big part of that. That's great. great. Yeah. You know, people love to donate benches in the names of relatives. People even love more, I think, to donate a tree that would be dedicated to something or someone that they want to remember. Tree donations are a place that people gravitate towards. A community can really get involved with tree donations to make sure we accelerate planting. Anyway, small thought. Thank you, Susan. We'll see you thanks, next Susan. meeting. All right. Thanks so much. Bye. Ernan, I, I cut you short. I didn't mean to there. Just want to make sure Susan got in. Um, hopefully you kept your thought. Um, can we pick up on it again or should we move on? Uh, no, I was just looking at this Amber Alert system. And I mean, right now it's, it's a federal thing, but it used to be before they went federal in 96, it used to be state managed. So you had Amber Alerts in Georgia, Hawaii, Arkansas, Utah. Um, and it basically sends um, yeah, all sorts of messages through text messages, uh, radio stations, um, and it even teamed up with Google, Facebook to relay information. So I don't know, I mean, it, and, you know, there are some criteria as to what constitutes a, an Amber Alert. Not all child adoptions are Amber Alerts, for example. So, I mean, if the state could, you know, kind of piggyback on this technology and create a similar protocol, um, I feel like that will be really useful because then, I mean, I didn't sign up for Amber Alerts and I still receive them, you know, and they, it makes me wary of, of the situation. Um, so I think that will be a, a really good way to reach people, to reach people without, uh, you know, having them to, without any effort on their part. Yeah, and I wonder if like the framework turned on for like the, the like Colorado tracker for like COVID exposures. Did anyone do this do that like on your phone and it would track your like basically tell you if you're in close proximity to someone who had tested positive recently and it would just give you an alert. Um, but something like that might be another framework that could be built on too for I don't know. Oh, and, and one more thing: the Amber Alerts are local, so it's like local law enforcement the one who the ones who submit the the alert. So basically it will be, for example, the city of Boulder or the county of Boulder that submits the alert to the county or the city. So it's not like the state has to do it. The state will just maybe manage the system like, you know, previous states did before they went federal. But then it's like local um, institutions, the ones who actually send the alerts to their citizens. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know, just something I thought of. Yep, very good. Uh, and uh, one more thing, uh, I know you mentioned wanting to make this data available. Um, I don't know if you guys have discussed building like some sort of um, API, uh, Miriam, like where 
like no, like not only like basically public entities or researchers could access the data. Have you heard of Berkeley Earth? So they uh, they're the, a lab. Not specifically, in, yeah. Yeah, they're a lab. They're a lab at the uh, University of California Berkeley, and they do like tons of data collection on temperature. Of you know, they have sensors all over the globe, and they're like I think the main data collection center for uh, you know climate change. Um, so what they have is um, a data page where you can access all the data they have. So if I was a researcher and wanted to do some, you know, write a paper on air quality, or even if I was a, a private company and was like, hey, you know, I want to offer notifications to the people who download my app. And um, um, I, I feel like it will be really useful. I don't know if I can share my screen, um, just to show you guys quickly. Let me see, one participant. Right. Oh, there we go. Um, so for example, this page has a bunch of data mm -hmm. uh, on their temperature measurements. Yeah, we and use then, that data. We use that data in our lab. Yeah. So then, like, if I was a developer, a public company, or a researcher, then you know, I could like download the data. Um, so just do, you know, in my app, like, do some co some sort of like, um, I get the data, and then in my app. Or on the on my like Bouldercast could use this data, you know, and then I open it and then I can visualize the the data. And, you know, and then I could put like some pretty user interface on top of this, and then you know, boom, I have a product. Or you know, so, I have a paper if I'm a so what's being developed is you know based on a map and it'll show you the result of the monitoring information that's being accessed. Um mm -hmm for this, this, you know, based on what's available in the state. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, I mean, there's lots of data sources out there um, and, and that looks like a good one as well. Yeah. But, um, but, I, that, 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 but that's, temp, that's temperature. And I guess what I was, what I would like to maybe suggest is like, make sure like this data is really easy to access. So like anybody can download it because I mean, my idea or what I thought of is like, if your data is really good, then why wouldn't private companies use it? You know, because then if I was a private company and I know you guys are going to be collecting this data and it's free and it's better than mine, then I feel like it's kind of a no brainer to just use your data. So then next time I look at my phone, it may be a private company that is showing me the data, but it's your data under the hood. Does that make sense? I don't know, just uh, um, uh, I believe that City of Denver is going to make the data accessible. Um, cool. Yeah, I believe that that is part of the process. Yeah. You know, it's, it's kind of interesting, Hernan, that you went to that site. Um, so if you wanted to look at time series of globally average temperature or temperature over the US, you know, there you go, you can hit a few buttons and suddenly you're a scientist and you have the graphics and you can tell your neighbors and friends that the planet is getting warmer. Um, but but there is even with that ease of access to data, there's the question of the quality of data, and it can be you know it can be risky sometimes to enable people with data that hasn't been quality controlled or, or homogenized as we like to use the phrase. So like the Berkeley Earth data is not homogenized for temporal variations and how measurements of temperature were done through time. So in the old days, people took temperatures at a certain time of day that's different than the way it's done today. It produces an artificial trend in temperature. So if you grab the Berkeley Earth data make your time series and you were doing it really quickly, you're gonna get something that's very interesting but very wrong in some areas. So all I'm saying is that, and, and we heard some of this from um, Miriam last, last month, is you know, the, the network needs to have a consistent quality to it so that you can compare a point to a point in a meaningful way that the measures are using the same calibration or instrumentation or whatever it is that you're using to measure your air quality and that you do consistent measurement through time so that you can create time series if you want to know what was it like a year ago or a month ago or a week ago 
So that's really an important part of enabling, if you want to do, enable people with data, that the data actually is quality controlled. Just throwing data out there can be as risky as not providing anything at all. Anyway, I just, that's an editorial comment. <laughs> we, we should probably go on. Um, letter to council is the next thing. And um, Brett, would you help us on this? Well, I, I, I wonder, especially with Susan um, having to step out, this was kind of part of her desired discussion, which is what are the next steps that EAB might want to consider in some of the other areas that it outlined in its letter to council? Um, it's, it's obviously working quite actively now on the air quality piece. Um, I did put out an invitation to the planning director to, to come and talk about urban heat island. Um, I haven't heard back from him about that yet. Um, so I think maybe it might be worth a kind of quick pass through this topic, but I know that Susan would want to be very actively involved in this discussion too. So the, and this is our letter to council that we submitted. Yes. Um, and you know, when I opened up the, uh, the link, and I, I didn't know if I was opening up the right thing. It was like 200 some odd pages. I said, well, we didn't submit 200 page letter to council. So, I, <laughs> um, and maybe you can pull it up on the screen to share just our first page, I think is probably the first page that is relevant or mistaken here. No, I've got, I've got it here. I'll, I'll pull it up for you. Okay. Uh, by the way, while you're doing that, just as a note, next month's meeting is Wednesday, June 2nd. I won't be able to um, be present at that meeting. Um, so I think your vice chair is Michael San Clementes. Yes, I believe I believe he is, and that's why I'm so glad to see him. <laughs> yeah, I got it. And if, if you can if you can fill in, and I'll also bring you our dog, then you can also watch two dogs. Sweet, drop her off. <laughs> <laughs> so Marty, that means that you will miss this discussion of the, the the climate action strategy. So we'll we'll make sure you know that that meeting will be recorded, so you'll be able to. To, to hear that if you want. So this this is, you know, right now my schedule looks like I, I'd be in transit. I could be mistaken. So I'm kind of, you know, laying the groundwork. If Mike is, is prepared, that's best. If I can get in in time, then I'll go ahead and do my best to dial in. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I won't have the commitment that like picking up had the stuff that kept me late the last two Wednesdays. So I like with school over, I can be here on time. Yeah. Yeah, super. So I'm, can you all see this, my screen, the letter that I'm scrolling through? So the first one was air quality. Obviously we've been talking about that. Um, the second one is around the Excel settlement. And I think some of the topics that Paul and others were raising in the comment period. Brett, I have a question on that actually. Was Susan able to get into that advisory group or, or which did she try? Do you know? I. I do not, I think that she did try. I don't know whether she okay. did. Um, so this is the second topic, um, just to go through them all. The third was regenerative ecosystems. Uh, this is a somewhat broader, I think, topic, um, probably really bringing in some of the forest wildfire considerations that the board has discussed in the past. Soils and sequestration, a, a piece that Michael has, Mike has helped lead, um, focus on for a number of years. And then the urban heat island. I think that was it, yeah. And you know, I guess the, uh, the urban heat island and the regen regenerative or forest um, regenerative ecosystem, they're kind of connected in a way, especially when we think about ecosystems within our city area and the canopy issue that Susan was raising. If I remember right, the numbers in the um, in the in the 2017 draft indicated that our canopy was was it 14 percent or expected to go to 12 or 10 percent because of the um, um, ash borer. Um, do you know roughly Brett, where that canopy is and the goal? What is it to be at 20 percent? Is that what's viewed as desirable? Yeah. So we we're about to get a new round of. Uh, what's called LIDAR data. I think most of you know it's a high um, resolution imagery that comes from satellites that can see topical or elevational things. So we're going to get that this fall. 
And then it'll be on the basis of that, that we can do a new urban forest canopy analysis to get a really good reading of what, because I think we did the last one in 2014 or 15. Um, it's a really interesting question because, you know, uh, forests were not endemic to this location. It was a plains, it was a grassland. Mm -hmm. And so when we say, you know, what is the canopy closure goal, um, there is no natural reference point for that. There is a reference point that we could think about, and that's something where I think we're trying to create some new science around this, like how much canopy closure would we want to achieve in order to achieve other benefits like uh, urban heat island management or stormwater infiltration? I think so, the, can I step in for a minute? The EAB has done work on this for the last several years, and, and I have documents and work studies that we've done <laughs> on this. So, um, are we going to use any of the information that we've already reviewed? Like, over, I have stuff from 2018, 2019. Um, <laughs> are you talking about uh, heat island stuff? Yeah, and yeah. urban can canopy. <laughs> well, yeah, I was just trying to set up for this for this point, which is okay. What, what's the right canopy closure goal for Boulder? And okay. and I think um, I think our current um, urban forest management strategy was like fourteen percent because our urban forester was saying like, what's possible given how we currently fund and fund urban forestry? I think. That's one of the reasons why we're trying to raise this issue more because I, I personally think we should be probably shooting for a much more ambitious goal like 20%, but that is a huge undertaking to achieve um, and would require both a significant reprioritization of city funding, but also a significant engagement of the community in something that it doesn't normally commit itself to doing. Mm -hmm. So I guess the, the short answer to what you're saying is I think we're gonna know a lot more by early next year when we do this new analysis based on the LIDAR data, but it is partly to be informed, I think, by some of this urban heat island um, analysis. And this is maybe uh, what Miriam's point is, the, the, you know, the, the meta research that has been done on EAB in the past, um, and I, I was only part of that briefly, um, but there were studies that estimated the cooling effect that doubling a canopy would have, you know, using a reference of some amount, doubling that canopy, which is kind of what you're talking about, Brett, 10% to 20%, that's almost, a, that's a doubling, would have a certain temperature effect, depends upon the, the latitude and the exposure of the city overall to climate. But, you know, it's on the order of, a, of, a, of more than a degree, let's put it that way, in a, in a sort of urban integrated sense, degree Fahrenheit. Um, which, you know, when you start thinking about climate change, what does that buy you in terms of time, right? Because in a way we're fighting the clock here, kind of like with COVID, we want to get vaccines in arms, but we also, you know, we, we, we want to, um, you know, so we don't want to get the exposure to the, the, the variants. So we, we're, we're fighting against time and the mutation. We're fighting against climate change and being able to be adaptive in a way that we can, be resilient. And, and so, because the hope is that at some point we'll actually be able to take carbon out of the air. We will, technology is there. We will actually be able to draw carbon back out, um, but it's gonna take a while. So in the meantime, you wanna buy that time. A degree Fahrenheit buys you something on the order of, oh, 20 years of climate change. That's a rough number, all right? Um, the, the globe is warmed about, two degrees Fahrenheit in the last hundred years is expected to warm another, about double that over the rest of the 21st century. So it'll buy you a couple of decades. Now, how long would it take to actually grow a canopy from 10 to 20%, even if you could, you know, if it was practical? Um, any idea how long that would take? I mean, that wouldn't happen in 10 years, I gather. Well, it would, I mean, to have a functional impact in terms of what those trees provide. It's probably a 25 to 30 year okay. task if you've yeah. got all those trees planted. 
Uh huh. So they have to do some growing. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, um, and Brett, I'm sorry I broke in there before, but I I hope that you know some of the work that was done has has informed what the city is doing now towards this, and and so we can feel good about that. <laughs> well, um, I think we talked about this a little bit last time. Um, there have been there's been such a a period of leadership transition over the last three years in the city that I think we we maybe this topic has not advanced as much as I think we would like to see it advance. And that's part of the reason why I'm trying to get the new planning director to visit with you, because I think this is an issue that that's the land use department and the, and the parks and rec department are the ones that truly manage those two resources. Um, and and one thing I would just note is, in the in the context of urban heating, impervious surfaces are immensely powerful as a as a thermal force. And I've heard the statistic. I haven't seen the research that says, it you need to increase tree canopy ten percent to achieve the same impact that reducing per, impervious surfaces one percent will achieve. So. One of the things that we have to also be looking at in addition to increasing tree cover is increasing our pervious surfaces. Yeah. So I guess long and short back to the letter, I will continue to try to push to get the um, planning director uh, on the EAB agenda so that we can pick up this urban heat island topic with him as well as the sort of influence of land use in climate change. I think those are two topics that I understand would be really good to talk with him about. I think well, Brett too, there are some really cool stuff in the notes I collected from like, maybe it was the city of Louisville, urban heat island study where they did a bunch, talked a lot about the trade-offs and synergies between like canopy and porous surfaces and the overall cumulative effects of different mixes of those was, I think in that study, which was pretty neat. I could try to, I'm pretty sure I have those notes somewhere in Google. Yeah, uh, I would really appreciate it. I know this is a, a we, we also, as you all know, lost our administrative assistant during this whole period of time. And so some of that stuff was being captured by, uh, by Delaney and others. If you could bring back to me all the stuff that you have that's easy to access around the urban heat island stuff, I'd really appreciate that. I have a lot. I keep everything. Great. Please. Um, <laughs> um, in fact, I'm here. It's just finding I, it in my Google Drive. <laughs> well, Heidi, I was going to say, Heidi, one of the things we've done in the past uh, when we were working on documents is to set up a Google Drive. And maybe this is, I don't remember when Delaney left, if we transferred that Google Drive to you, but I think it would be great if we could set one up so that we could put all of this information that the EABs collected in that place that's accessible to everyone. Yeah. We can definitely look into that. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, yeah, coming back to Susan's, uh, parting words, she, she was, um, you know, challenging us to think as we, as we've been doing, you know, wonderfully on the air quality effort to find the actionable activity um, related to our other items on, on our letter to uh, council. Um, so maybe in the near term, collecting what the board has done previously over the last many years, on the urban heat island, you know, condensing it, refreshing it where it's appropriate. I mean, the experience of 2020 brings it back to the fore as being a concern that can't just be sort of relegated to, well, we don't have a heat island problem here. It was terribly hot last summer. Yeah. Um, so I think it brought the awareness back and, um, and maybe the action would be, let's recollect what we had done, refresh it as is possible, new information if there is any, and then report back to, um, I guess, to this board, but then perhaps find a space on an agenda to city somewhere, council somewhere, or? Yeah, I think, again, I think the a next really good step would be for us to get um, Jacob Lindsay, the planning director in, if we can, and start okay. the conversation there. Um, yeah. So that's good action items. That, okay. uh, Marty, I, was there, you're at NOAA, right? Yep. 
Um, I also think that last summer was a very telling um, time frame in terms of the, the summer temperatures and especially the evening temperatures. Is there somebody at NOAA that's tracking that for our local area? So it's interesting. Um, we, we have a weather station that's almost on the NOAA facility site of Broadway and 27th Way. Um, <clears throat> They monitor um, daily high and low temperature precipitation. We don't have a great boulder record. It's moved around. It's, it, it's kind of <laughs> small bit of shame for a city that has all this yeah. technical scientific capability on, and no, um, no, around, <laughs> you know, that, that we have to be apologetic about our, our climate records in the, in the area. Uh -huh. So I'm gonna say it's not as good as we would like it to be. Okay. But we might at least be able to, oh, well, yeah. I, I would love to see if there's a, already a clear signature. These last several summers have been, I've, in my experience, substantially warmer, just noticing how much air conditioning needs uh, our household and others have been describing. Um, maybe but we can also see if, if CDPHE is, is, is monitoring temperature and at any of the stations that they have here as well. Yeah, and Leon's had our same tower in the parking lot at headquarters here, yeah. running for ten years now, collecting temperature the same way as the other forty-seven sites around the country. So, well, that'd be cool if we could even just pick up those three different sources and see what we could see there. But let me also put it on my list. I mean, there's a data set which we like to use from time to time. It's four kilometers in scale, covers the whole U.S., and it gives maximum maximum and minimum temperature. It goes back. <clears throat> monthly to 1895, if you believe it. Wow. Um, but it's more reliable in the last 50 years than it was before then. Yeah. But you know, one of the outstanding characteristics of the temperature time series over the last century for the US is, is that the minimum temperature has risen um, at least as much, if not more than the maximum temperature. This yeah. is especially true in the middle of the country where the maximum temperatures haven't risen nearly as much as the minimum. And so that's led to heat stress concerns because the min is really where the heat stress right. begins to become an issue. The nighttime, if it doesn't cool off, you right. can't find ventilation, that's right. where the body really suffers. So I know where you're going with this. I think the health component really links to the min as much as maybe even more than the max. Yeah. Usually the, the as bad as the max is, the hottest time of day, it's the driest time of day. <clears throat> and so the, the body has a way of cooling itself in a way that it can at night when the temperature drops down to the dew point. It, yeah, the, yeah. the other aspect in this environment, of course, is that it was always the minimum, it was the evening temperatures that were really important to cooling all of the built environment. And we don't have that sort of cooling force now in the evenings as we once did. Yeah, no, the, back to your point about all the concrete that we have, road yeah. surfaces and concrete and buildings is, is that they emit the heat accumulated during the day for a good part of the night. <laughs> and, and so, you know, you hardly get, that's, that's part of the conspiracy of the heat island. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I just think about like in the summer, like walking our trash cans out to the curb at like 9 30 PM or 10 PM sometimes. And it's like without yeah. shoes on and the sidewalk is still so hot. And like our driveway yeah. is still so hot. <laughs> Brett, who was the professor that gave the presentation on the temperature measurements from CU? We had Paul. Uh, Paul Chinowski. Chinowski, yeah. Yeah. Is, is he still tracking it or no? Uh, I that's a good question, and there's a there's a project with the county that it might be really good to get in front of this EAB, where they're working with Paul on. Um, climate resilience and and sort of risk vulnerable like mapping the most vulnerable um, areas against a number of different hazards or threats so i'll um, try to circle around and find out about that as well okay well marty i think that's probably we don't have anything else on the agenda for tonight no okay we're good and then again no Item eight, we have next month's meeting scheduled for June 2nd. Um, Mike is graciously going to pr prepare himself to be, be the uh, chair of the day. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question actually for Brett. It do, is the city have any thoughts or timelines on reconvening these boards in person? Hmm. Oh, that's a really interesting question. 
we still don't know when we're even going to bring the majority of the city staff back on. So I think, I don't know how many of you saw the reporting over this last week or so, but this new realization that we're probably not going to hit herd immunity anytime soon in the, in the country, I think has a lot of people sort of reconsidering what our safe strategies are. So I don't, I certainly wouldn't anticipate us doing that till late this year at the earliest. Okay. It's interesting that same conversation, Mike and Brett came up in the call I was on with management NOAA today, the local, you know, the um, NIST facility on Broadway. Um, I'm in the David Skaggs research building, and of course, we would all love to be able to re-enter our buildings if nothing else than to collect our personal belongings, including our baseball cards and whatnot that we left in our offices and toys, but we can't go in. And so the question was, well, it, what's the plan, right? Um, and, uh, you know, President Biden has made it very clear he wants to see the country open up for 4th of July. Mm -hmm. uh, NOAA has made it very clear that they're not going that fast. They have no intentions of going that fast. And of course, that, that creates an interesting tension within, within government. If the yeah. president wants you to be opened up on 4th of July, this being a federal building, um, but the uh, right now it, it's kind of in turmoil. Um, no one really knows what the standards should be. No one really knows what the legal aspects should be. You know what's required. What can you require a person to have a vaccine or not? There's all com complexity around this, and the risk. You just want to be as conservative with the risk as possible, and so you know we're also looking at a situation where probably not until after. Labor Day at the earliest. Yeah, and I was talking, um, we have some workshop funds from NSF with like NCAR right now, I do. And we we're talking about like, we had asked for a no cost extension because it was like, there's no way even in the early fall that we would right. be in this fiscal year that we're going to get up to NCAR and get people together in person from like around the country. There's no way. So yeah, I think yeah. locally, yeah, I'm just curious if people will start, the city will start. It comes down to figuring out what's essential and what's not. If you're essential, it's a different story. Yeah. But, you know, I've been a non-essential worker for the federal government for 35 years, and that's not going to change tomorrow. So, so long as we can party, work, maybe tomorrow is the big day. <laughs> you think it's a big day? Yeah. Suddenly I became essential. I don't think so. And so the question, you know, is the EAB essential to city functioning? Well, probably not. Not at that level of risk taking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So but we can function in this manner, too. It's yeah. not. It's, yeah. not, <laughs> it's, it's right. not ideal, but it works. Yeah. Martin, have you not been into your office once? No. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. And the, the amazing thing about this is, you know, I, I kind of direct a team, there's about 10 of us, is that I would have never predicted this. Of course, you know, being in climate, my predictions are worthless anyway, but I would have never predicted the productivity of the group. And, you know, the, the internet and, and the access, you know, high, it's, it's incredible, right? None of, this, none of this existed 35, 40 years ago. We would have really been in trouble. I yeah, think it's it, actually the opposite direction, though. I think it's it's made us hyper productive in a way that's really damaging to well-being. I agree. That was my point to management today. I said, you know, the numbers may look great, but it's not sustainable. No, it's not. People are going to burn out, man. Yes, absolutely. People need to see the goalpost where this is going to come to an end. Yeah. You know, give us give us a date roughly and give us an aspiration that we can begin expecting the return. Yeah, your point is, Gazak, mark on, Brett. Yeah. Well, with that, <laughs> it's eight o'clock. All Good right. You all. Um, so let's do a um, closing of the meeting. Um, what was the move protocol? Move to meeting? adjourn. Thank there you. Move to adjourn. Second that? Yep, second. All right. Adjourn. Sounds good. Anon, your second meeting. Way to go. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Take care. All right. Bye, Peace everyone. Bye-bye.